Good afternoon. This is another edition of Kung Fu Physics. We're working our way through practice physics GRE problems. And today I have a nice mechanics problem for you. It's number 21 off of the 1996 exam. So there's much to talk about in this problem. So I'm going to start right into it. As usual, I like to glance at the answers quickly before I start reading the problem itself. In this case, I see the answers are all fairly close in magnitude. They're all of the same units. So to me, this is going to be doing some type of numerical calculation, um, perhaps an approximation that I, I will have to be fairly accurate on because those look to be pretty close in magnitude. Those answers look to be pretty close in magnitude. So I'm not going to be able to eliminate anything. I'm going to have to correctly do the problem and just pick the right answer automatically eliminating the wrong ones. Uh oh, So off we go. Number 21. The period of a physical pendulum is 2 pi times the square root of I over MGD where I is the moment of inertia about the pivot point and D is the distance from the pivot to the center of mass. A circular hoop hangs from a nail on a barn wall. The mass of the hoop is 3 kilograms and its radius is 20 centimeters. If it is displaced slightly by a passing breeze, what is the period of the resulting oscillation? Okay, so getting a physical picture in your head, uh, probably not a terrible idea to draw a very, very quick picture of what's going on here. If nothing else, something as simple as this, I would say, will probably suffice. So you've got this hoop. This is the nail it's hanging on. And this breeze sort of uh, disturbs it. And it's oscillating with presumably a, a small amplitude about this axis. So it will be working as a pendulum. In this case, it's described as a physical pendulum. And they give us the equation for a physical pendulum. Incidentally, I would say that this is one of the very, well, as far as the physics problems that I've worked out and posted videos for so far, this is one of the few physics GRE problems that has comes straight out of the gate and gives you the exact formula you need to solve the problem right there in the text of the problem. And so, you know, don't look a gift horse in the mouse to do this problem. If you were actually doing this, you would just happily maybe write down the equation for uh, the period of a physical pendulum and sort of start plugging stuff in from there. They are asking you for the period of this hoop. And this is indeed a physical pendulum. So we would write this down, the equation that they give us. I would say that this is not a bad equation to memorize. If not this one, then the one for frequency or of a physical pendulum or, or whatever period or frequency, whatever you'd be more comfortable memorizing. You should memorize something like this because if I'm not mistaken, by all means, post a uh, comment if I am mistaken, but there are other physics GRE problems where this is uh, an equation like this is critical. You're dealing with a physical pendulum and you have to remember the equation and calculate a period. Um, you have to remember this rather than have it given to you in the problem. So after babbling on about that, what I'm really trying to say is this is not a bad thing to commit to memory. Equations regarding the period or angular frequency or whatever of a physical pendulum. Okay, so let's go on and solve this problem. So we know the mass of the total hoop. We are assuming G is going to be here on planet Earth as 10 meters per second squared, um, an approximation from our 9.8. But for the physics GRE, we use 10. D, uh, I'm going to write D in here. D is the distance between the nail to the center. And they give it as 0 0.2, uh, excuse me, 20 centimeters. 
and I want to convert that in my head immediately to 0.2 meters. When I see 20 centimeters, and I know all the other units are going to be standard units, I just immediately, the first thing I write on paper is do that conversion in my head because it's an easy conversion to do. So to me, that's 20 centimeters, 0.2 meters, and I write it that way. Other than that, we need I. We need the moment of inertia of a hoop. That's an H. A hoop about the nail. And this is where I messed the problem up. I actually did this problem on my own before anything else, before, when I was just looking at it. And uh, <laughs> I calculated the moment of inertia wrong, uh, and I got the wrong answer. I messed this up. So uh, I wouldn't, I don't know. I think this is a bit of a trappy problem, to be honest. Uh, there's other places to get screwed up and waste time other than this silly mistake that I made. But I, I calculated the moment of inertia of the hoop wrong. I forgot that it was the going about this nail rather than the center. And so I forgot that I need to use the parallel axis theorem to do this. And what the parallel axis theorem is, is just you're taking the uh, moment of inertia of the center of mass, about the center of mass, and you have to add in the factor that compensates for you using a, a rotation around another axis that's not the center of mass. And you basically end up taking the whole mass of the object and multiplying it by the distance, we'll call it big R, um, the distance from the center of mass to the pivot point or the, the axis of rotation squared. If you don't know this by now, look at some of the other videos I posted, mechanics videos. Incredibly important to be very good with the parallel axis theorem for the physics GRE. Um, incredibly important. If you don't know it, review it and get comfortable with that because there are numerous. I think I posted four or five other problems uh, where I utilize the parallel axis theorem. So expect it. Expect it on the physics GRE. It's not hard, thankfully but expected. So in, in this case, what is the center of mass of a hoop? I, I kind of want to go into this a little bit, um, but I don't know that I have the time to do it. You will notice, if you look at the equation sheet for the physics GRE, they give you three typical moments of inertia, a rod, a disc, and a sphere. They do not give you the moment of inertia of a hoop about the center of mass. Fortunately, it's very easy to remember. It looks exactly the same as calculating the moment of inertia of a point particle. And to me, that makes a lot of sense because if I have a little differential element, a little tiny point particle here in this hoop, if I called it, you know, mass dm, uh, that, that would contribute dm times r squared to the uh, moment of inertia about the center of mass. And then if I just went along and added all those up, they're all located at a distance r. Eventually, I would end up with the whole mass of the hoop multiplied by r squared. That is, in fact, the uh, moment of inertia of a hoop about center of mass. It's just the, the total mass of the hoop multiplied by the radius of the hoop squared. Then... Now the catch is because we're not going around the center, and this is a little tricky. It's tricky the way they set this up. We're going about the nail. The nail is located at distance r. We'll call r the radius of the hoop in this case. It's located at a distance, uh, you know what, no. Uh, at this point, I'm not gonna call it r because for specifically r hoop, we're calling the radius of r hoop, hoop d. So let me correct that, and we'll call that md squared plus and this is, again, we're shrinking the, uh, the hoop down, treating it as a point mass. So its total mass is going to be m. And it is, again, located at a distance d between the pivot point and the center mass at d squared. This is a little just, just a mind game they're playing with you, that these look exactly the same. They're two, representing two very different things. And in a different type of problem, these could be very different. They're just playing a mind game. In this... In this situation they look exactly the same and you just simplify it to md squared 
That is the moment of inertia of the hoop about the nail, and that's what you need. So, blah, blah, blah. Going on and on. We are trying to be quick about this, but we need to substitute in stuff now. So we would get 2 MD squared. Substitute that in for I. Divided by MGD. Clearly, stuff will start canceling at this point. The mass of the hoop cancels. One of these Ds will cancel. We get T equals 2 pi square root of 2D divided by G. And at this point, we actually have to put some uh, something numerical in there with the hopes of getting our answer out. So we get T equals 2 pi square root of 2 times 0.2 divided by 10. You notice that the mass canceled out. Um, that may freak you out a little bit, um, but study physical pendulums and, and with a symmetrical pendulum like that, you'll see that that is, uh, that is what would happen. It's independent of the mass. So, um, yeah, I guess I, sh I should say more about that, but I am trying to hurry in this. So, the, it is independent of the mass. What they give you there, the mass being 3 kilograms completely unnecessary information. It's a little bit of a bait to a trap that they put in there for you. Cause you get to hear and say, oh no, they gave me the mass and I'm not using it. But it's, it's a extraneous information. You don't need the mass of this physical pendulum. So, I want you to look at this. Now this is the other thing that you have to do well to do this problem fast. And that is make an approximation of this. I know there are those of you that are math geniuses out there that you don't even see 2 pi square root. You just, you know what that is. And you can do the math all in your head and stuff. I'm not that good with the math, personally. And I know there's other people out there watching these videos that are in the same boat as I am. Um, so you need an approximation. You need a little trick to knock it out quick and give you something easy. And usually, thankfully, Usually the test makers know this and, and they've, they've sort of built the problem with that trick in there. And so I wanna show you what I think is the most likely way they did this. When you're looking at this, can you come up with a, a slick way to clear this square root sign? You've got two times 0.2 divided by 10. Hopefully you see it. And uh, it, is, it is pretty slick. Just take the two and divide it by the point, or divide it by the 10 and end up with a 0.2. So you get 0.2 times 0.2 under square root sign. That's slick, right? So it just comes right out. You get 2 times 0.2 times pi for t. And at this point, when I see that, I know I got it beat because I can make a quick and dirty approximation for pi. I can call pi, uh, well, I'll do it over here. I can call pi just 3.14. And then when I see this, I'm just doubling it twice. So I get 6.28 and uh, 12.56. I'm just doubling that twice. I have to adjust for the decimal place because it wasn't actually two, it was 0.2. So that leads me to 1.256. T is approximated as 1.256 and I, if I got there, I'm hoping at this point that I am close enough to one of my answers. Certainly, I can round that up and get answer C. I'm really pretty close to answer C, which is 1.3 seconds. And that's how I would answer. So a couple of little tricks there as far as uh, getting, doing the, the number crunching um, and it's a, it's a little bit of a, I would describe it as a little bit of a trappy problem. And potentially, certainly, if you get tied up in just getting the approximation at the end and you get freaked out because you got a square root and, and a pi and, and stuff in there, um, it could potentially be a bit of a time sink, a time waster of a problem. But don't let it do that to you. You know, if, if you aren't getting the answer fast, then you're going about it the wrong way. Uh, first step if if you don't get it in a couple minutes is you need to back up and try something else and then if you don't get it you need to move on and not get stuck in a a time sink 
a trap of a problem. So that's it. Nice mechanics problem number 21 off of the 1996 exam. I hope this helps you, and as always, good luck and study hard.